Good morning. It's a pleasure to greet you. I'm Pastor Bruce Anderson of Winfield Community United Methodist Church, and welcome to our online worship service. Our first reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. Jesus begins his Galilean ministry. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. And there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except a widow at Zarephath, in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. May we be blessed by our hearing and understanding of the word this morning. Pastor Fred Craddock tells the story of his father, who spent years of his life hiding from the God who was seeking him out. When the pastor used to come from my mother's church to call on him, my father would say, You don't care about me. I know how churches are. You want another pledge, another name, right? Another name, another pledge. Isn't that the whole point of church? Get another name, another pledge. My nervous mother would run into the kitchen crying for fear of someone's feelings being hurt. When we had an evangelistic campaign, the pastor would bring the evangelist, introduce him to my father, and my father would always say the same thing. You don't care about me. Another name, another pledge. Another name, another pledge. I know about churches. I guess I heard it a thousand times. One time, though, he didn't say it. He was at the Veterans Hospital. He was down to 74 pounds. They had taken out his throat and put in a metal tube and said, Mr. Craddock, you should have come earlier. But this cancer is awful far advanced. We'll treat it, but we don't know. I went in to see him. 
In every window there were potted plants and flowers. Everywhere there was a place to set them, potted plants and flowers. Even on that thing that swings out over your bed they, that they put food on, there was a big flower. There was by his bed a stack of cards, 10 or 15 inches deep. I looked at the cards sprinkled in the flowers. I read the cards beside his bed. And I want to tell you that every card, every blossom, every potted plant were from groups. Sunday school classes, women's groups, youth groups, men's Bible class of my mother's church. Every one of them. My father saw me reading them. He could not speak, but he took a Kleenex box and wrote something on the side from Shakespeare's Hamlet. He wrote on the side, In this harsh world, draw your breath in pain and tell my story. I said, What is your story, Daddy? And he wrote, I was wrong. It's not until you know God is seeking you in love, not in condemnation. It is not until that moment that the gospel becomes good news for you. I think that may be some of what's behind this morning's scripture readings. Jesus starts out well and is well received. But then he points out that it's hard for a prophet to be accepted in his hometown as familiarity breeds contempt. Hey, we know this guy. Is this not Joseph's son? How can he be a prophet? Make him prove it. Show us something miraculous. Then Jesus went on to call out the errant belief of the congregation, saying, God's good news is not limited to Israel alone. He pointed out that in the past, Prophets had been sent to outsiders, such as the case of Elijah being sent to a widow in Sidon rather than a widow in Israel, and the prophet Elisha cleansing Naaman, the Syrian commander, rather than a Hebrew. At a time when gods were considered territorial, a universal god was not seen as good news. It meant God's grace had been and would continue to be offered beyond the borders of Israel and Judah so that God's chosen people were no longer so unique or special. All people were God's people. That filled the people in the synagogue with rage, enough rage that they wanted to kill the prophet that they had thought so highly of just moments before. It seems that parochial interests have always led to feelings of entitlement and then to anger when that entitlement is not realized or, worse yet, is renounced. The people wanted Israel to be a world power rather than a light and a blessing to the nations. I look at the protests that we have seen over the past year as a perfect example. There have been people from both the left and the right of the political spectrum that have gathered to exercise their First Amendment right to free speech. And there have been people on the left and on the right who have taken that too far into armed violence and destruction. Protesting is fine, even good. Destruction and violence is not. There is no justification for it. No matter who does it, it's wrong. And our cancel culture goes too far as well, demonizing those who may have been in an area peacefully, as if they were part of those who were violent and destructive, and often without any proof. Guilt by association is not right either. It seems that our allegiances today are secular and not religious. Morality and civility have just gone out the window. People today seem to worship their ideology more than God. That leads to idolatry, 
So there is no center ground where Christ stands to mediate between the extremes of today's secular issues. It's my way or the highway. There's no room for compromise as the extremes drowned out those in the center. People don't want a chance to be heard and discuss things anymore. They, they want to browbeat or even physically beat others into believing and acting as they do and can no longer tolerate a difference of opinion. The ends seem to justify the means and win at any cost seems to have become the order of the day. It's now okay to lie and cheat and steal as long as it is the people that agree with my position that are doing it to accumulate more power and influence for my side of the argument. That is not the way of Jesus. Jesus called out wrongdoing and wrong thinking wherever he found it, even among his own disciples and his own religious leaders. A dispute also arose among Jesus' disciples as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. And, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven, for you do not go in yourselves, and when others are going in, you stop them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. So you on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And even to his closest friends, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Our society today seems to be focusing only on human things, getting and exercising power over, not power with. God's power is power with, extending power to the poor and powerless, including the outcast to build community, serving those in need, not requiring child sacrifices as loyalty tests as the Baals did. Jesus was not one who sought to destroy those who disagreed with him. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him, on their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command a fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. They just walked away. Even Christianity these days seems polarized. The fundamentalists preach, turn or burn, believe like we do, or you're going to hell. And on the other extreme, oh, whatever's all right, do as you like, it's okay as long as you come to church. 
Jesus was in the middle ground, willing to heal, forgive, and include, but also calling out unrighteousness and abuse of power. When the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus in charges of sedition, he told them, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. The things of God must be more important than the things of Caesar, more important than our idols, but more and more often they're not. That's why elected leaders, election workers, and journalists are receiving death threats, and our nation's and state's capitals are receiving terrorist threats. Devotion to God is losing to our commitment to the idols of ideology, power, and wealth. Humility is hard to find these days. Jesus came in love and humility to serve God and God's people, seeking to turn others to repentance, including his country and his religion. All of us have things to repent of. Those who believe that they have no reason to repent are usually those who are farthest from God's kingdom, like the elder brother of the prodigal son in his self-righteousness. It's hard to work with those who revile you, but we are called to try to reach them with the love and grace of God, as Jesus did. When it comes to lies, physical violence, and destruction, it's time to call it out so we're not enabling it. And it must be called out regardless of who it is that's doing it. We have seen that hate speech eventually leads to acts of intolerance, anger, and violence. As Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We must not validate hate by allowing ourselves to become pawns in a campaign of discord. We're not puppets. We're Christians. We now live in a time where being puppets is not only encouraged, but rewarded, and independent thinking is attacked. All we can do as Christians is to seek to follow the example of Christ Jesus as closely as we can, loving God and loving neighbor. We can think and let think, as John Wesley encouraged. As an independent, I have voted Republican and I have voted Democrat, and often on the same ballot. My politics is not what defines me. I try to keep that definition as Christian. I have a friend from college whose beliefs are quite different from mine. And sometimes I call him out on social media when I think he's spreading racism, ignorance, or lies. And he tells me I'm too naive and trusting. Well, I see it the other way around. But we still keep in touch. We don't hate each other. We just disagree. We know we won't change the other's mind, and that is okay. We're still brothers in Christ. Anger and fear and hate are the tools of the devil. Truth is truth and lies are lies and those that perpetuate lies are helping to spread darkness and fear rather than light and love. Christ, in Christ there is searching, healing, repentance, and forgiveness. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins, go and point out the fault, and the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may can be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile, as a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, 
and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. As Paul said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Peter wrote, those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And again from Paul, See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seeks to do good to one another and to all. Jesus and his disciples knew what it was to stand for God's truth against worldly power and were able to persevere. Let us seek to live humbly and love completely as Christ did, valuing the truth, but not thinking that we know all the answers being willing to explore and question, and then admitting that there are some questions that we may never know the answers to on this side of heaven. This life is preparation for the life to come. Jesus came to lead and serve and not as a dictator. God's love is invitational and not coercive. And good news is only good news for those willing to receive it and serve God. May we all seek to live peacefully and righteously with our neighbors. May God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now let us join together in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we come into our time of prayer together. Please let me know how we can pray for you. Email prayer requests to pastor at winfieldumc.org. I am pleased to let you know that Todd is recovering well. He is off the ventilator and they are reducing his level of oxygen and he is starting to eat regular food. It is hoped that he will be able to leave the hospital for rehab in a week or two. So, good news there. And Olive shared the joy of Vivian and Valerie's birthday coming up on the 23rd. Some concerns that I have received. Um, Ern is in danger of losing his home and needs to gather a large sum of money in a short period of time. So we will be putting together a GoFundMe page to try to help him out. And Kathy, Vicky's partner, fell and broke four ribs and faces a long and painful recovery period. I found out that Jeff's back surgery has been delayed until January 26, so let's keep Jeff and his surgery in our prayers. And let us pray for the violence in the Capitol, for all those involved, those who are receiving threats, that we may have a peaceful transfer of power coming up. 
I'll have has let me know that Joey and Pearl Tino and Joy George Ogerio have died of COVID. So let us keep them and their families in our prayers. And also let us pray about the new and more virulent strains of COVID that have been discovered and is starting to spread throughout the United States and Europe. Let us pray. Lord, what we have loosed on earth is not good. We have trusted those who have lied to us and have those who have perpetuated the lies of others. We have been told to fear the poor and the oppressed and the foreigner when our original sin of white supremacy has been growing right under our noses the whole time. Forgive us, Lord, and teach us to seek to proclaim the truth no matter the cost. Lord, I pray that we will see a peaceful transfer of power in Washington coming up and that your way of peace and love will reign supreme. Lord, help us to reach out in love and compassion to our neighbors and those who are sick and hurting, those who have lost income, who have lost loved ones and property. Lord, help us to follow Christ's example of selfless service to others and to follow that example as we reach out to those we encounter in the world around us this week and every day. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come into our time of the offering together. We are gathering funds for the Red Band in January and February, which is for Grace Children's Hospital and Pediatric Clinic in Haiti. I ask you to continue sending in your tithes and offerings, mailing them to P.O. Box 359, Winfield, Illinois, 60190, or by texting to give by texting the word FUNDS to 844-928-1220. Now let us dedicate our gifts. Lord, you have called us to your service, so we bring our tithes and offerings to straighten the way of those that work in your harvest fields. Bless both gift and giver to the service of your kingdom, we pray. Amen. Now let us join together in hymn number 568, Christ for the World We Sing.
As we go forth into the world this week, let us extend the grace and love of Christ to those we meet in this time of heightened stress and uncertainty, being Christ to those we meet. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen.